Origin refuted the notion of creationism and allowed science to advance to what we know today. Unfortunately, the vivisection community rejected Darwin's idea in favor of creationism. Today, whenever animals are used to model humans, the practice is based on the rejection of evolution. Creationism taught that all animals were created based on the same template, the only difference being that animals did not have souls, while humans did. During the 1800s, animal modeling met with some success because it studied organisms at lower levels of organization. For example, determining the function of organs and that some diseases were infectious. Today, we are studying higher levels of organization, which is where drug and disease response occur. Animal modeling has taught scientists interesting facts about various species strains, but it has been an unqualified failure in medicine in terms of predicting human response to drugs and disease. The reasons for this involve scientific concepts that are impossible to communicate to people who lack a broad background in science. Even many scientists do not understand these concepts. What is easy to communicate is the many instances of failures of animal bodies. For example, roughly 90% of drugs that pass animal tests fail in humans. This failure rate would not be tolerated in any other field, and that alone should cause the, be the abandonment of animal modeling. Many drugs have probably been lost because of adverse effects in animals that would not have occurred in humans. The U.S. National Cancer Institute believes society may have lost cures for cancers because the drugs fail in animal tests. The only way that animal modeling is going to end is by getting scientists to speak out about the lack of scientific viability of the practice. This way can be accomplished is by a peer-reviewed scientific debate judged by independent experts from the relevant fields of science. For Life on Earth has been calling for this and has support in Parliament. But surprisingly, the vested interest groups are refusing to participate. The debate is fair, transparent, and scientifically beyond dispute. So why would the animal model community oppose it? The only reason they oppose it, in my opinion, is because of money. Last year, 3.7 million animals were experimented on in British laboratories. The experiments would have included such horrors. Just think of this, imagine this being you, as being burned, poisoned, gassed, electrocuted, force-fed, injected with cancer cells, and being surgically mutilated. And when that torment is over, most of the animals are killed. The ways animals are killed are equally horrific as the way they live. They can be given overdoses, suffocated, have their necks broken, or be bled to death. Animal Aid recently launched a campaign called Indefensible, which is focusing on warfare experiments. And in common with all experiments, the animals who are victims to warfare experiments are subject to the stresses and deprivations of life in a laboratory. Not only are they suffering, but there are secrecy laws which prevent information about animal experiments ever being made public. Additionally, as animal aid are finding out, the MOD do not want to part with the information that they have about warfare experiments. Animal Aid, under the Freedom of Information Act, has requested information from Port and Down. Port and Down, as you will probably all know, is a secret government laboratory where ex animal experiments are conducted. Other establishments have supplied this information in 20 working days. Port and Down took almost six months. They've cited national security and international relations as the reasons that they will not provide us with the information. Animal Aid has pushed and pushed and have now finally received some of the information we, we requested. The suffering that animals endure in warfare experiments is truly horrific. Our recent exposés have highlighted guinea pigs who were exposed to the toxic nerve agent VX. 
these beautiful animals were exposed to the VX and then observed to see if they displayed symptoms such as writhing and gasping. Guinea pigs only breathe through their mouths when they're in extreme distress. The guinea pigs were also permanently tethered to a pump so that blood could be taken and substances given to them whenever the researchers wanted. Those that didn't die during the experiment were then killed. Animal Aid's latest expose has, dealed, has detailed how marmosets were exposed to Ebola. We know from human cases of Ebola that it can cause horrific suffering, bleeding from the eyes, noses and other orifices. The justification for exposing marmosets to Ebola was that the disease may be weaponized. These tiny marmoset monkeys were taken from the breeding colony at Porton Down and used in experiments. Their suffering is truly horrific. It was described by the animal researchers in this manner. Overt signs of infection included a hunched posture, unkempt fur, altered respiration, subdued nature and a reluctance to move, eat or drink. External hemorrhaging from the genitals was observed in four animals. Half of all animal experiments in Britain take place on university campuses. This is a shocking statistic, but one we believe could be changed. We've been sending freedom of information requests to almost every single university in Britain. Every year, without fail, since 2016. And we've seen a very clear pattern. We believe that universities are deliberately evading answering questions about their animal experiments using a loophole in the Freedom of Information Act 2000, which means that universities can refuse to provide even their most basic information because, they say, they plan to publish this information on a website at some point later in the year, thus effectively hindering our chance of telling the public when we need to tell them about animals and what is happening to them inside universities laboratories. Some of you might have seen our missing campaign which we launched recently, exposing the use of rabbits in universities. We named that campaign Missing because we are literally unable to find out what animals are housed inside British universities and how many. Out of 112 universities and university colleges contacted by Animal Justice Project this year, seven universities haven't bothered answering at all. Over half of the universities contacted, which we know have animals, have refused to provide us the information we asked. And 33 universities, such as UCL, Edinburgh, King's College London, Oxford University, Manchester University, Imperial College London and Cambridge University, have flat out refused to provide answers. Last month, we exposed some of the worst experiments we've ever seen on rats and mice at Cardiff University. A university killing almost 500,000 animals a year. Researchers have been subjecting animals there to severe brain damage. Yeah, shame on them. They are using animals to see the effects of party drugs, of all things. Something that we see a lot at animal at British universities. Rodents being injected with speed, MDMA, ecstasy, alcohol and nicotine. We see it all the time. The very same researchers at Cardiff that were involved in the notorious kitten experiments at the university back in 2012 are at it again, continuing their cruel and frankly bizarre experiments on mice and tree shrews, as if this makes it any better. Over the last couple of years, researchers at Cardiff have crushed countless nerves of rodents. Attached steel rods and electrodes to their skulls, glued glass windows and aluminium plates into their brains and induced crippling diseases. In one tuberculosis study, researchers induced inflammation into the brains and nervous systems of mice and watched as the animals became paralysed and died. They've injected drugs into brains and left animals for months to assess seizures. They've forced rodents to run on 
treadmills while their heads are restrained in devices and induced arthritis by injecting toxins into animals' joints, causing ankles and legs to swell and paws to be deformed. Rats have had cannulas implanted into their brains so that research could inject lethal substances. They've had drugs injected into their eyeballs, been given nasty lesions and are routinely, routinely forced to swim in water tanks. They've been drugged with liquid ecstasy and again left to suffer as researchers look on. All life is one. That's how it was put by the person whose birthday on the 24th of April is commemorated by World Day for Animals in Laboratories, Hugh Dowdy. And I'd like to say something about that most remarkable man, Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowdy. The man who directed the RAF's fighter command during the Battle of Britain in 1940. The man who is therefore to be credited with preventing the defeat and invasion of this country at that time. Here was a person answerable for the fate of countless humans at a critical moment in human history, answerable in particular for the young fighter pilots who risked dreadful injury or death in the sky. And it was known that he did feel very great care and concern for the welfare of those men. After all, one of them was his own son. So did he therefore come out of that war believing that there's a special sanctity in our human life, some special entitlement that obliges all the other animals to serve our interests. On the contrary, he expressly objected to the use of animals in defence research at Porton Down and at Harwell. Not just was it cruel and futile, he believed that all vivisection actually promoted war. And this is what he said. Failure to recognize our responsibilities towards the animal kingdom is a cause of many of the calamities which now beset the nations of the world. Nearly all of us have a deep-rooted wish for peace, peace on earth, but we shall never attain to true peace until we recognize the place of animals in the scheme of things and treat them accordingly. That was Hugh Dowding. And he said that in the House of Lords because he'd been made Baron Dowding in 1943 and he used his time in the House of Lords again and again to present the case for animals. Animals in circuses, animals in slaughterhouses, animals on farms but especially animals in laboratories. And probably the House of Lords has never before or since heard such plain speaking on that subject. At the beginning of one of those debates he said this, the process of preparing this motion has been a most painful one to me because it has compelled me to read of many cases of revolting and sickening cruelty. And he went on to describe some of those cases to their lordships. Cats at the Royal Naval Laboratory made to breathe 100% oxygen until they convulsed and died. Monkeys at the Lister Institute infected with rabies. The joining together of rats as Siamese twins. That last one was being carried out at this university, where Dowding was astonished by what he called the callous attitude of the people and also the absolute uselessness of some of the experiments. Well, no doubt things have changed. Perhaps there are fewer useless experiments nowadays, here at least. 
but it was never Dowding's aim to make animal research more strictly useful. Here's what he said on that point. I want to make clear at the outset my own personal opinion. It is this, that even should it be conclusively proved that human beings benefit directly from the suffering of animals, its infliction would nevertheless be unethical and wrong. Yes, unethical and wrong. And not because we're animal lovers. We may or may not love animals, so very much the better if we do. But that's beside the point. What we know is that they are life as we are life. They value their part in life as we value ours. And they have as much right to it as we have to ours. <laughs> Well, that's what it means to say all life is one. We know it to be a factual truth. Science itself has told us so. Well, let science practice what it teaches and give our fellow creatures their own lives back. Thank you.